part two. Here. These bits that we're going to cover here, these principles of effective graphic design, just the four of them we're going to cover, are not only applicable to everything that we're going to make forever in here, okay, for, but they're forever in video, forever in broadcast video. Even yearbook uh, is a critical to that. But I'm going to extend it farther than that. They're critical to your English report. Okay? They're critical to your presentation if you're doing like a senior showcase and you're going to present something. Your designs, all of them, whether it's your doodles or your actual you know, graphic design, which is my flyer, should become better after having heard this lecture. And it's going to be forever and ever. Your Christmas card when you're 40, you should be thinking about these four elements, deciding now it looks good, and making little tweaks on these four elements, saying, oh, now I get it. Before we get to the four elements, here's a video which covers... That's not fun. Open. Here's a little video which is pretty interesting, which touches on R4, but also would uh, talk about maybe if you're taking a high-level college graphic design class, it kind of dabbles in those, but it's entertaining either way, if it'll load. So what makes the brand iconic? It's more than a logo. Iconic brands tap into values, aspirations, desires, mythology. They foster an emotional connection that leads to loyalty and purchase. Yeah, yeah, but how do you make a brand iconic? With the fundamental elements of design. Let's start small with a simple point. What's the point? Together, points make a line. Line has direction, weight, Gesture. Gesture? Spirit. Gestalt. Line. Lines then combine to make two-dimensional objects that we call shapes. Or an outline, or a silhouette. These shapes are regular and geometric. Others may be irregular and organic. When put together, shapes can define one another. You mean they contrast? Right. Contrast is a fundamental principle of design. The juxtaposition of dissimilar elements creates tension. Sounds easy enough. Well, it isn't just black and white. These colors are organized in a wheel that maps complementary tones like warmth and cool. Color is defined by hue, how we normally reference color by names, like yellow and green. Saturation, the dominance of hue and color, and value, otherwise known as lightness or darkness. Color is the first element the mind sees and the last it begets. Yeah, but how do I pull this all together? Composition is emphasis on a focal point against the background strengthened through scale. Whether radial, symmetrical, or asymmetrical, composition is... This is getting exhausted. Then let's speed up the rhythm, which provides order in composition. Repetition and variation in groups creates a pattern. And what if you need to get more specific? Spell it out. Typeface, where the traditional serif or a modern sans serif can act as a product's voice. And if that falls flat? Form is the three-dimensional partner of shape. Forms can be basic, complex and often merged together. On this surface we find texture, matte, glossy, rough, smooth. Kind of seems like a whole new world. Negative space creates a mold around the positive space of form. Okay, but should we use all these tools at once? No. Aim for harmony and simplicity, the concept of separate elements. Design is the careful balance of these principles. Our goal is to create clear, consistent emotional connections. And with a common visual vocabulary, we can make brands iconic. You've got it. Call to it. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, they chose the dweeby white guy's voice to be the dweeby white guy in the British car. Okay. So we touched on lots of things there, and I wish this was a semester-long class and we could you know, really hone in on all those small elements. But here's the four that we're going to talk to. It shouldn't be a total surprise to you, but I have mentioned them. I even wrote them on the whiteboard over there a while back. 
So the four, you don't necessarily need to write them down now because we're going to cover them all in the future. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Here in high school, we call that your car. Okay? You better focus on your car, on your design. Not only because it's the, what I would say are the four maybe most important to get a good design done, but it's also the four that you're going to get graded on. When you get your logo back, you're going to have a grade for contracts, a grade for alignment, repetition, proximity. Same for business cards, flyers, whatever. But some students who don't go to church enough reposition those letters to mean something else, which, if you want to, and it helps you remember it that way, I'm okay with that. You can't say I don't go to church because that look. It's literally maybe, maybe now you need to go to church more. We call it oh, a car. <laughs> so, looking at car, we're gonna break them down individually. And we're gonna start kind of. We kind of. Put, I put them in a, a logical order, at least the way to describe them. So the first thing is proximity, and proximity. The principle is relatively easy. Put things that are related together and keep things that are related apart from each other. Sounds very simple, but what you might want to keep in the back of your head is all the design you've done so far. And maybe you're going to start to realize, ooh, I didn't really do that there. I kind of snapped everything on the page. So proximity is all about space, keeping your space for those groups. It's about grouping and space. And that might be the best thing to write about. Proximity is all about grouping and space. If that sounds like a question, I'm not sure. Next. So some of this PowerPoint's not going to look as good because it's not playing in full screen. But here's a bad proximity example. Imagine Mike's not there to look at the other part. But this is a business card. It's got the information of the business card, address, phone number, and all that. The problem is nothing is grouped logically. Things are just put, oh, I'm going to group upper one in this corner, one in this corner. There's four corners and there's four bits of information. I'll put them there. Sounds like a beginning design that they can be safe. Okay? The eye has to wander all over. Clients. Okay, the clients of your client really, they don't they don't want to spend time trying to figure out what's going on. They've got other stuff to do. Okay? They want the business card to have the information and make sense. So, better. Take the logical information, put it into groups, get a little bit of separation. Now it makes sense to me, I know exactly what I'm looking at. There's a guy, there's his name, and I'm good to go. Okay? Next, we'll look at that same sample side by side here. I remember you following. You're typing a lot more than that on the side. Okay. Here's your two. Same kind of example. But again, it's not hard. It's just something to be really aware of. How do I group things logically? Here's an example that we see, and we'll be making these for the client, they're called letterheads. They pre-print them across the top of paper. Hutchinson High School has them. So when I want to go write a personal letter home to your mom and dad, I write it on our letterhead. And what it shows is, if, well, what this example shows as far as that helps me, if you group things together, you might really screw up the meaning of what you're trying to say. This one to me says, University of West, what's happening in? They're grouped together, so that's what I will do. Right? The actual intention of this letterhead was to be what's happening in Redwood County Forest. This study, let's say it's a forest sample study, is being put on by the University of West Cooperative Extension in August of 1996. But you can see between the two of them, the bad grouping here. I get the 1996 part, but I, I wouldn't make this connection, right? They're too far apart. It's 
got four spacing and I've put I placed the place the two things together that were close together. See it all the time. Go to a Chinese restaurant where they, you know, I don't know who designed the menus at most Chinese restaurants, but it's usually just what's up. And take yourself to like Lavelle's, where you know they had some you paid somebody a lot of money to design out their menu for their menu. And things would be spaced. I see. Go here. Good. That means too close together. It's gotten a lot of grouping. The chances of me finding what I'm really looking at this list for is low. Okay, over here, the group, the space. The group, the space. And I'm doing much, much better. Okay. So, all of that boils down to this big idea which in some ways I would call white space the rule of thirds of graphic design. Where we, where we learn and express and look crazy about the rule of thirds, we'll also be similarly stressing this idea of white space. And what that is, is white space is a chance for your presentation to take a breath. More or less for your client's mind to say, okay, I've got that, these are the drinks, take a break. These are the appetizers. Great. These are the, what I need for that break in my mind is white space. So if I was to stand up here and just start talking to you and make a little cover parts of the alignment and how does it teach me that homework and all that you get done after that you can go to the real book track so I can learn it for you. So I figured you'd really like that. I don't get it. I don't get it. And you're going to do either tune out or walk away, which are two things we don't want. As we get that person to stop and look at our cool poster, and then all of a sudden it starts going, and then I'm out. And I see this. I watch very carefully when you guys get your yearbooks in May. And I, I love to sit there and watch people open them. And I see flip, flip, flip. And I can almost guess who that's that. I know what page you're looking at, because that page has good spacing and good art and good all this stuff that makes people stay there versus like, whoa, I'm, I'm walking right past that. There's two kinds of white space, passive and, passive and active. Oh, I see. Yeah, active, that's right. Active white space provides the breathing, creates up ideas. Passive white space is just space between objects or space that's misplaced on a page. So we'll look at it here. This is like the cover of a, uh, think about like you buy a stereo and then you get the, the little manual. This is typically what a cover will look like. Uh, it's kind of one, one bit, two bit. In between that active white space, that breathing area, you're okay. And moving on to kind of a different topic here. And a different topic is Passive white space, this letter, this space is in the letter. The main thing you need to worry about passive white space, well, there's two, I guess it's a good one. You need to plan, organize, and really orchestrate and control your active white space. I moved it, not that far enough, and you move it a little bit more, or it's too much, and you move it closer. Active white space, you really control. Passive white space, you really need to be checking as like a caution. Okay, does that look right? I would say in some ways this passive white space right here is maybe a little bit of a problem. We'll talk about trapped white space in there. So, this is a nice flyer. We can see, oh, the picture, the name of the band, okay, some little like tagline about them, tell me what's going on, and then you break. Okay. And now I'm all about reading about it. Read about it, read about it, and I get a break again before I get into you know, the producer's name or whatever that might be. So there's good space here. It's also a good spot to tell you white space doesn't mean it has to be white. White space is just a place where there's no information. Usually it's well it's historically called white because of course almost everything at the beginning was printed on white. And they weren't doing like full color full-page print stuff. It was just really lucky to get a picture on the newspaper. 
So, how do I check it? The idea here is we design something, Mr. Johnson is going to look at it and grade it, you're going to look at it, you're going to review it, you know, I say, hey, you can make this design, what do you think? When she thinks that something's wrong with the proximity or she wants to check it, squint your eyes. It's called the squint test. When I squint my eyes and look at design, I should see logical grouping of information. It can be a little hard for you guys in the back to do, and you're impossible. But when I grade yearbook pages, okay, I'll look at a yearbook page and I'll kind of squint, and I should see groups. This page, group nicely over here. This is Okay. I should be able to squint my eyes and kind of get an idea of the subsections of this page. Now, as I look at it a little farther, it's kind of messy because it's just about cross country. But let's say this was the boys versus girls page. Okay. I should be able to squint my eyes and see a section dedicated to like cheering crowd section. Squint my eyes and think, yeah, okay, there's a group. And I open my eyes and I say, oh, that's all cheering, you know, crowd pictures. I just my eyes again and I say, no, look over here. And I open my eyes and I realize that's all pictures from the egg rolling context. Okay. The three to five is, of course, the pin. If I just logo, I open my eyes, I should probably just do one piece if it's just a logo. All right. But as you get bigger and bigger, brochures, your book pages, you squint your eyes, you can see logical groups. Do me a favor and those of you that wrote it down, underline, put a star, smiley face next to the word purpose. The absolute worst thing that you can do is come to Mr. Johnson and say, Check this design out. And I say, Yeah. Why did you put that there? Okay. Okay. Well, Take all the take all the computers down to the you know construction kid over to the middle side and say, make a liar and put this here, put that there, put this there. So now we know better. It's the same as with the photographs, right? It's not that some of you aren't already creating great designs. Some of you are taking great photographs and say, how are you taking them? Like, eh, wow, that's what I did. That's what you did. Okay? Not anymore. Right? Now, everything that we do, we say, well, okay, yeah, I framed it, got a little third, I realized one of the fingers, so I got lower, and I jumped into the angle, and I got some light, and I got up, I don't know. Okay? So, do everything you're doing here with a purpose. Especially do Okay. This poster we're going to use to kind of break down and talk. Uh, so, this will be a little feedback section. This is a poster. It's relatively simple. It's neither a great poster, it's not the best flyer I've ever seen, nor is it the worst one. What I did is I went and I put little letters, these little blue dots I added, to give you a chance to kind of talk about this poster with me. So, Sharon, where is an area that you see and you can use like, okay, I'm still at number 67 or whatever. Where's an area you see good proximity to the future? Numbers to say, I'm in that area over there. Where we see more good grouping. That would be. I mean, where, do we, where do we see things grouped that we're like, yeah, that makes sense that we put all that together? Designed out well, but it's a repetition in, in a little bit about why that's good repetition. But that's what we're talking about group, group, and fair way. Is that busted? Can you see them for the Yeah. Dang it! 
Take your computer, your notes, whatever you've got, stand up, and go to a different table. Is this going to be a Regardless, when we talk about alignment, we're not talking about left, right, and center alignment. Okay? We, we, we will talk about those, but we're talking a little bit bigger picture than that. We make groups. We've taken our information and we've grouped it logically. That's kind of the first step in our design. We now need to think about how do we want to end the lineup. And there's really two ways that we answer that question. One is, do we want an inherent shape in our design? Is there a shape that comes from the picture that we've already shown in, or is there a shape that just feels like ours, you know, slanted, could be a race car flyer, could be diagonal line, all right? So is there already things put in? And then the other thing is, are some of these connected? Even though I want his name and his title, then he's also a teacher, that makes a sense. That's one part of the group in my business card. All my address information, it's similar to my name. I don't want them all together. I don't want to get confused that way, or, or two, they're not that related. But they're related enough that they should be in line. It makes sense to go together. And that's this bottom part, and maybe the more important or more commonly mistaken thing, create visual connections between the pieces. This is me. That's my address. Okay? We see that here. Similar business card, same business card. Never had any lines that kind of work. We really want a very wide bigger than now. Okay? Nothing was lined up. I would quite literally take in Photoshop and I would drag down guidelines, straight lines that I can use Photoshop as an imaginary straight lines I can bring in. And if you are off by two pixels on alignment, really fine. Okay? So we'll need to be, if, if I've got my name and my address, and those should be lined up, we need to get them lined up to the pixel. So the one sixth of an inch is what a pixel is. Okay? So when we look at a better version of this, we see exactly what I was saying. It could be business. The name of the guy is lined up with where he's working. I've created a visual connection between those two, and now my person that has this card knows what's going on. Yes. Though, when I hand you a business card and you're taking notes, you're going to take it right-handed, right? This is. This will be an interesting conversation that you guys will want to know because in like two weeks you're creating business cards. Elsie says it's on the wrong side of the page, which I, I'm not saying she's wrong, but these are all active things, or at least this one is. A business card is meant to be given to someone. Oftentimes, here's my business card, and somebody's taking some notes. I'm going to get a conference. Here's my business card. They pick up my business card and they write little notes. This and I pay thousand dollars and they're with What are they doing with my business card? They're holding it. What are they writing? Well, what's the great majority of the documents? Right handed. If I put that information left the line, meaning it's lined up on the other side, what's happening? Okay. 
So, weird thing to have to think about. But, and, and Elsie's right, it would make maybe more sense as far as if it's something that's meant to be just seen, left the line on the top, right? But if it's something that's maybe meant to be pulled, we have to think about how are they going to hold it and what, what does that matter? Is it? So here we see alignment. Okay? I'm going to start on the right hand side. First, we see good proximity. It's a good grouping of information. Here's our kind of name and our little slogan and our sponsor. And it's all there. It's in its own group. I'm like, yeah. And then I'm like, what do we do? Groups. They're closer. To, these are closer to each other than this because they're more related to each other than they are related to this. But then we see that alignment. Okay. So my mind and my 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 thought process puts these connections between all of those pieces that make sense to me. Okay. Another thing to point out: I just etch this permanently in your brain. In here, you will not. In the area, probably everything. Okay. In the graphic design world, we do what's called block formatting. Some of you might be thinking about this with your client letter right now. English paper, yeah, you're writing an essay, you get to a new paragraph, push the tab button to end it. You don't do that in graphic design. Not right now, anyway. You block format. Everything is left aligned, hard left aligned. When you get to a new paragraph, Space. We also very rarely will do things like double spacing, triple spacing, and any of that stuff. That's all good well for the English class, different class. Okay. Same thing here. A lot of visual connections. You see all of the critics' reviews, they're all aligned. Okay? This is what we said about this movie. But then they took the awards and they positioned them differently. Okay? The position of two awards aren't in line with that. Now, they're still associated. We're not saying it doesn't make any connection, but they're different things. They're things of different amount of attention. I wouldn't want, if I was a designer, if I was a producer of this movie, I wouldn't want people to lose the significance of these because they mixed up and gave stuff the way what Bob from the Newsliner said. I don't want an Academy Award. I don't really want that. I want, I want that information kind of highlighted a little bit differently not connected to too much that is not. Okay? So that's an idea of alignment. We see it, of course, in web design as well. Here's an example screenshot of a pretty cool little poster and uh, same kind of idea as the other one. So now let's take just a second to talk about that whole center left and right and how I'm going to choose. And the main thing, the main habit that we need to break you from regarding that is center alignment is bad. We'll start with that as a blanket statement, and you have to understand rules are made to be broken. I say center alignment is bad. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're never going to have a chance to ever center again in here. It just means that you should start with the idea of I'm going to have a really good explanation from Mr. Johnson about why I centered it. Okay. Here's why it's bad. When you were in second grade, Miss Myers said, Hey class, we're going to the computer lab. And we're all very happy to be huddled down to the computer lab. We sat down at the computer and she said, We're going to write your first paragraph on how your Christmas break was. She said, The first thing you need is a title. And she said, That will show you a cool trick. And we all learned about the little button that's the good thing to see. <laughs> and for the next 10 years, you're going to be centering the titles of your essays. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with centering the titles of your essays. The thing is, an essay is boring. Today, amateurish. Second grade knows how to do it. And it's boring. Who got the design? For essays, it makes total sense. I'm not knocking this mic. You keep it really like stuff. But when we're designing stuff in graphic design, centered text is generally considered for design. It's cheap. It looks too formal. So unless you're going for formal, sedate, amateur, and boring, stay away from centering your text. Period. 
So there you go. More professional looking. Let's just vote because I actually have a little bit of spare to Left hand side. Right hand side. Okay. Which one looks more professional? Okay. <coughs> Again, not a problem. Miss Johnson could, could design this. Okay. <laughs> and Miss Johnson, Johnson could design both of them. But we are the ones that are to think of designing it like this. And here's what happens. So let's say that this is in a Fred Meyer, right? The little hallway there in Fred Meyer, all the little flyers. You probably never paid attention to the man you're going to because I just mentioned it. Okay. If you walk down there, you're going to see Nissan dealership, Fred Meyer's coupons, and you're going to see Joe's having a And you're going to notice something. You're going to notice Nissan dealership. You've got a huge advertising team. There this is. Left line to right line. Same with Fred Meyer's coupons. The big clothes, advertising team. Joe's drug. Joe's drug sale coming up place. It's going to be really big. It's going to be awesome. Not quite well. These are all rednecks. Well, it's not a team. Oh, my God. It's a redneck. Does everyone who talks like this is a redneck? I heard it. No, I was no. So Mr. Johnson said never center, but your poor, poor bodies can not be able to take it. And I say you better than center the stock. That's how all of our quote things are. They're like all center. Yeah. You want to change? I don't see it. Why didn't you see the change? <laughs> Centering with style. When you center, you need to center with really big intention. If you come up to me and you'll show it to me, and the first thing I'll do without even reading it, looking at it, I'll kind of squint at it. I'll see the group, I'll see anything center and I say, what? He said, what? I wanted to go out and put it into it. So I centered it. So what did you do to make that centering not formal to the form? Here's one option. You take every single word and put it on its own thing. And what you've created here is kind of a neat shape. Miranda, what's the shape? Okay, take your fingers pointed at the at the U. Okay. And we go down, what you shape? It should look similar. Now I know what you're all I know what you're all thinking. You're like, oh, does that make it a sexy in the system? No, it doesn't make it a sexy. Yeah. It's an S curve. It's gotta be no. But what is this? What is this statement ultimately trying to get someone to do? No, notice it, but specifically, what is the invitation? It's trying to make them go to the party. Come to the party. What is the S curve aside from hotness? <laughs> what is the S curve? Uh, well, <laughs> specifically, well, am I punching Elena? Yeah, I got movement, yeah? Oh. S curve was hotness. S curve was movement. You have snake coil, right? It can do something. Right? So centering it and creating an S curve shape. So Mr. Johnson said, why did you center that? And they say, well, by centering it, I created an S curve shape. It's because the intention is for them to come to the party, I created a feeling of movement. And it's about to work. Then I go even better with it. Then Mr. Johnson says, no, we didn't do it. But the scoop that has to be over. And then you're like, oh, you see my. I say, yeah, because you need to add something to this side because you're creating. It's time. Asymmetrical balance. Okay. So now I have this kind of 
rather warm invitation, or I can get really crazy with it and crank it over the right hand side. Regardless, never just center. Always center with style. Here's one you don't know about, but you want to learn, you're going to learn to love and hate at the same time. And that's justified text. Amanda and Natalie can probably uh, allude to some of the love and the hate of this. And Sarah. And Sarah. And Sarah. 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 Not that Sarah. Um, <laughs> justified text. Oftentimes when we start thinking about our design, we're going to think about it not in terms of the actual information that goes there, but it's almost like we could take, and Michael's got the best seat in the house, I think the designer, because it's a whiteboard table, and we'll just draw it out with it. You're like, okay, I want my flyer. Here it's going to have kind of a title here, and then there's going to be a picture there, and then there's going to be three pictures here, and then there's going to be all the rest. Let's think about my design in terms of boxes and circles. Justified text plays off of that in a way that says this is the area for text. It's going to both left align it and right align it at the same time. And what it then does is it takes and it changes the spacing in between the words so that they can be left and right aligned at the same time. It looks really clean. I can show it because it looks really nice right here. We're doing a computer page. Okay. okay. This looks really nice. Even from the far. This is justified text, left and right aligned. There's not some kind of weird, etchy, sketchy edge. Because what you get when you left the line, sometimes you can get really weird edges. And it doesn't look clean. So the whole yearbook is kind of meant to be a little bit here. Yeah, because I always love you when it's extra space between the words, and I always see that extra space between the words, and I always do it for one second. Like I said, some of these things are going to come to you guys later. <laughs> Yeah, it's odd. I'm just saying, you guys got dumped into a situation where they just provided you know, that stuff. Um, here's where it gets really hard. It gets really hard with, you can see the spacing on line number two doesn't look so bad. The reason that the spacing on line number one is screwed up is because the word justified. It's so long that they couldn't put it up here because it can't snatch words over the top of each other. So when they move a big word down, they have to use space it. One of the things that I do when, when I'm editing the yearbook pages is I'll oftentimes have to go and change the wording just because of the fact that if I wrote Super Power Five Book of the Yellow Okay, it's going to make the spacing It's going to make the spacing very, very odd for the line that's above it. It's going to be really spaced out. It's well worth your time to use justified text. <coughs> And change your, it's better to change the wording than it is to go off screw on the left line and the work. Because no matter what, super calipatic is just allogosis is going to stick way out, and then the next lines may not. So one way or the other, you're going to get weird spacing, justified text, and maybe if nothing else to piss up to Mr. Johnson, it's a great look. Okay? Just like headroom. Yeah, okay. I don't really agree with this, but I'm going to do this wrong and be kind of good on this design. There's justified text, kind of artistic um, typography there. Pretty cool looking. And that's kind of justified text via typography, stretching letters out make, or making them bigger. You see justified text all the time, of course, in the you know, full work the magazine with the newsstand the next time you're at Freddy's, and you see it justified text. Is that like for the first word, and like, so it like takes up space? That's called drop caps. And that was bothering me for every single word. Yeah. It was an E when I was little, and I was like, that word isn't a word. So, yeah, you're talking about here? Yeah. This is called drop caps, and it's a setting. You can set it in Photoshop, you can set it in InDesign, and you basically say, for this paragraph, in the setting box, you say, I want it to be drop caps. This one may say three spaces. One, two, three. So the first word 
And that paragraph is the three baselines help. And you can set it to, like in our yearbook, the first word in the, in the sentence is two. You've got to drop that to uh, two. You can set it for the first letter of the first word. You can set it for the first word of the first letter. Of the first letter. All right, here's the most common screwed up part that uh, the most common mistake you will make. And that is trapped white space. And what trapped white space is, is oftentimes tacit white space that you're trapping, is when you have an inherent line in your design. So Charlie, where's the inherent line in your design? What's a line that I don't have a lot of control over? Person, well, a person, yeah, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. I'm more talking about the border of this picture, right? It's got this black border. So there's a line there. There's a line right here. And if I don't recognize that that line's there, and then I left the line my text that's next to it, all of a sudden, because of that same spacing, see the big word? Okay, the big word here. Okay, that pop down. You can see that I think this is white space. What's white space good for, Shannon? Remember before when I was talking really fast and it was over and over again very quickly? And I said, what does white space provide for us? <laughs> you don't remember? I was just saying, I'm talking really fast and I'm going really fast and then I need to take a Break or pause. Well, here's what happens. Some, somebody's been handed this. Their intention is to read it. So they give it to me. I get initially interested because I'm like, oh, cool picture, which is, oh, that's a neat, you know, that font, the title grabs my eyes, which is in Wonderland. And I start reading. Da -da -da -da, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I go Taco Bell, I'm hungry, I'm out. <laughs> We have a pause here where we don't want people to pause. Trapped white space pauses an instance in your design. Spend my time there for a moment. Pauses an instance in your design where you have people stop thinking about what you're showing them and they think about whatever's on their mind, which maybe Taco Bell. Okay? So all of a sudden, they're out. And they miss this part which is maybe the part where they learn that they can buy something if you're working on advertising. Or maybe something that is really important about the story that you're trying to present. So you don't, you can't have that white space and it happens because it usually there's a line of problem. Fix it, just write a line. Very weird, it's gonna feel weird to you to choose a text box and choose write a line. You're so used to left line, so you might be like, well, I'll try justifying or speaking out. Okay. Hard to choose right line. So if I have a line, then you create a second line. Now everything looks really nice. There's no weird breaks for me, and I'm going to go. By, by the way, a number of the words in here, for those of you who are trying to read this, like what is this all about? A number of the words in here are actually graphic line words, so words like center alley, and gutter, and parsons, and all of that. Not, not all of them. <laughs> not all of them. At first, when I first saw that, I was like, oh, that's cool, they're all words. And I was like, wait, what is Bang and Bang? Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> bang is actually a, a graphic like design. It's like Cinderella. Okay. So here's alignment in a nutshell. When you're talking alignment, find the lines in your design and use them. Maybe the lines come from the graphic that you're showing. You have this picture, you want to use this picture, awesome, use it, now you've got to design around this line. Most of graphic design, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Because you only make one decision. Okay, I choose this picture. All of a sudden, I've got color choices that are inherent because this picture is a certain color, so I've got these other colors. This grouping makes sense, and I'm doing this with this and this. And all of it makes sense. You stop making all these decisions because they're already made for you based off of your first one. Find the lines and use them. Stay away from centering your text. Then do it, muscle it, do it with some style. And again, 
have a purpose. Bring me a thing. Why did you do that? You better have an answer. Okay. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's another be. I don't know. I just kind of like, huh? I'll just tilt it. How many of you did type R to it? Or like, get busy living, get busy done. And I'm like, I've been saying you need to have a touch of this. I'm like, hmm. Let me say it. Let's use a sample. Uh, Zendra. An area of alignment here that you. Because there's actually good and bad alignment in here. But let's start with this. Okay. So 15 through 27, all lined up. Kind of all related information, makes sense, line it all up. Good, Amanda. Something else aligned with the slide. And this box? And this box? Yeah. yeah. Notice something interesting. This is not exactly left to line. It's aligned to go with its trapezoid. Okay. And the trapezoid is slightly tilted. So what do I do with the left line of that? I'll sort that as well. The same thing happens here. See, these aren't perfectly straight up and down. They're slightly tilted. Why? Because this is slightly tilted. So to take the baseline of this, is isn't flat, it's tilted, because that's tilted. The last one I'll point out for you, because I don't want to try to have. Look, they've chosen this target. It's, a, it's, our, it's what I call a stopper. I'm walking down the hall, I'm like, whoa, target, baseball, what's going on? And then I see, oh, they got to curve that. How weird would this look if this was straight? So that's the line. By the way, I'm going to parallelogram. Don't forget your notes on Friday because we've got more to cover and we'll be hustling. And if you want to do that extra credit, check in with me on the career you're doing. Well, that can't be a trap then. It's a parallelogram. Oh, that's a parallelogram. That's what I said, right? This is on the note. What's her name? Oh, you can't. Not really. Yeah, I guess so, but. Well, I didn't add them for that. I added them so we could talk about Area 23 or whatever. I guess you could call that a fine trap. Parallelogram. What?